Distinguished panelists and dear participants, very good afternoon. Welcome to the Fudan JNU NIIC Trilateral Dialogue. It is our first dialogue on China, India, Nepal trilateral relations, and we we wish to do it in series. We hope to we hope that we continue to get support from Fudan University and the Orlando University for this initiative in future. We we are starting this dialogue at a critical time. It is not a good time in terms of global or regional situation. Globally, we are struggling with the virus. And at regional level, there are news of a standoff between India and China and border issues between India, Nepal, and China. However, we take this forward because difficult times provide extraordinary opportunities. To initiate this discussion, we have invited excellent panelists from Fudan University, Jawaharlal Nehru, Nehru University, and Nepal. I do not think we can have excellent panel than this on this issue. None of the panelists need this introduction, at least to our audience. Let me warmly welcome to all our speakers, Professor Estumani, Professor Emiratus Zainu, thank you for being with us, sir. We'd also like to welcome Professor Zhang Jiadong, Director, Center for South Asian Studies, Puran University, Shanghai. I must thank Professor Jiadong for taking the initiative forward and agreeing to be our partner for today's event. We also want to welcome uh, Dr. Deepak Prakash Bhatta, Member of Parliament, Nepal, who is also a scholar on international relations, who has always been supportive to me for uh, since my JNU days. Professor B. R. Deepak, Chairperson, Center for Chinese and Southeast Asian Studies, JNU, eminent scholar on China studies, who was kind enough to join us as a partner. We'd also like to welcome Professor Lin Mi Wang, Director, uh, Deputy Director, Center for South Asian Studies, Huran University. I take Professor Wang as my supervisor. He has opened a door for me to China with a number of academic engagement and academic collaboration. Thank you all. We will give 10 minutes to each speaker for the initial remarks, we'll make it, and which will be followed by question and answers. Audience and people watching on Facebook Live are requested to drop the message in the comment box or in the chat of the Zoom room. I uh, will make sure it reaches to the speakers. Uh, 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 Professor Muni, you will have 10 minutes and you start, your time starts now. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Jaiswal and the NIIC for inviting me to this panel. It is very exciting that all the three representatives from three uh, neighboring countries are talking to each other. Uh, Dr. Jaiswal asked me to focus on India-Nepal relations and therefore I will not uh, go into others, other areas. Uh, we'll be happy to answer questions if later on they are there. Uh, make a couple of points uh, in 10 minutes. You can't go into too many details. Now, first point which I wish to make is that the old cliches do not really explain India-Nepal relations today. The cliches like uh, roti beti ka samman, like civilizational bonds, like special relations, they are uh, they sound very good. They may have some uh, reality also in the relationship but they don't really explain the dynamics of very evolving, fast evolving uh, bilateral relationship uh, which we have. If we want to make them relevant, these cliches and the historical aspects of it, we have to link it to the present and future. And unless we use them in shaping present and future, simply by chanting the past is not going to help at all. Look at this special relationship. I think 1950 treaty was based on the so-called special relationship. And it is seriously questioned in Nepal. And India has also said, OK, if you want to change it, we are willing to change it. Now, there are one or two aspects of 1950 treaty, which are often, uh, I would say, ignored in, in, in the discussion. One aspect is that 1950 treaty, besides other things, besides mutual interdependence, insecurity and economic relations was also signed and, and, and projected particularly by India as a sign of Nepal's sovereign independence. I might, uh, it may be an unpleasant truth, but the fact remained that during the Ranas, uh, Nepal was almost a vassal state of the British Empire. And uh, the, the, the Rana prime ministers had a seat in the Chamber of Princes, though they, they sat separately. Therefore, all over the world, there was an image that Nepal may not be truly independent. India tried to um, uh, remove that misunderstanding 
at the time of uh, membership to the United Nations and, and did everything. And this treaty was, I think, one of the major steps to tell the world that we too are independent countries. Nepal is a sovereign independent country as it has always been. Second foundation, uh, there are many other foundations. I'm not discussing them. I'm discussing major changes which have taken place. Uh, and, and this aspect of uh, asserting Nepal's independence to 1950 treaty is today completely forgotten. Secondly, uh, uh, second base of the treaty was that we had a common concern towards the rise of communist China after the victory of the communist revolution. And therefore, both of the countries had concern about their security. And they decided to tie up uh, with each other on security matters. This again is no more relevant today, certainly for Nepal, because Nepal doesn't feel that China is uh, any source of threat to them. Though India continues to feel it. And we have problems on the border even today, very serious discussions are going on. Therefore, what I'm saying is that when we refer to these old cliches, some of the fundamental ground has shifted and therefore they cannot completely explain it. Why has it, why has it happened? Uh, I think there are three major uh, uh, areas which we must draw our attention to. First is that both India and Nepal today, at least for the last 10 years, have made tremendous changes in these two countries. And they are different countries from what they were during the 50s and the 60s. Nepal is no longer a monarchy. It's a very vibrant democracy. And it's a young country, comparatively as also India is a young country, full of youth, full of aspirations, full of self-confidence, and therefore full of their own national identity. This is a fact which I think India has been very slow in grasping. And as a result, a lot of misunderstandings come up and people who are neutral like me are, you know, being dragged as uh, representing India and being bashed on many of these issues, but that's a, that's a separate story. The fact remains that India has not been able to understand these aspirations of new Nepal. Unfortunately, the Maoists wanted to create a new Nepal. In fact, their entire uh, radical uh, revolution was based upon creating a new Nepal. And unfortunately, they have utterly failed in terms of governance and anything else to create new Nepal. And they are back to the old, you know, the. Uh, what you call partial democracy, structural democracy, uh, kind of a form on which they are, they are working. So the first aspect of development is that there is a new Nepal, which India has not been able to understand, grasp, be sensitive to properly. Secondly, India is also new. When I said it is not only Nepal which has changed, India has changed tremendously. Economically, it is no longer the you know, Hindu rate of economic growth going at 3% or whatever else it is. Uh, the corona might have affected, all the countries have been affected, but India is a burgeoning economy. It's a growing economy. It has uh, uh, grown uh, very fast and tremendously developed. India is also a new country. India, 65% of the people are, are young people and they have their own aspirations, economic aspirations. And they also have their confidence and nationalism, which has particularly been, to my mind, it is somehow distorted by uh, the, the Hindutva element, which have come to power in India. But they are highly nationalist. I would say to some, some extent, uh, uh, ultra-nationalist. And their nationalism reflects on Pakistan, on China, on, uh, on religious issues. Uh, similarly, in Nepal, most of the nationalism reflects on India. And it is vis-a-vis -vis India, they, they, they want to have an identity. So this new India, which is economically vibrant, which is economically growing, uh, which has a vast population, which has its own dynamism, its own ambitions and aspirations to play a role in Asia and the world, and also having huge economic aspirations for development of its own people, who were uh, almost more than 30%, 40%, are still below poverty line. So Nepal has to understand that India also. The other day I said, Nepal has no center of Indian studies uh, uh, where uh, India can, otherwise ordinarily every Nepali is an expert, on, every Nepali is an expert on India. 
and every Indian is an expert on Nepal. But you know, that is largely the popular belief. But we don't understand each other uh, properly. So this is one major development which has taken place. And unless we try to understand each other, uh, uh, find uh, each other's sensitive sensitivities, I think the relations would continue to dwindle in one way or the other. Secondly, as I mentioned, uh, there is a rising nationalism. I have already mentioned that. And that rising nationalism sometimes uh, is confronting each other rather than collating each other. Nationalism, Rabindranath Tagore said, a radical nationalism is a very negative force. It's not a positive force. If you want to make nationalism positive, it should be more on creative lines, more on the identity, cultural, religious, social identity, aspirational identity, which we have, rather than pitted against each other. If we have our nationalism as pitting against each other, it would be very negative, very harmful to either of us. And I think we have got to grow out of uh, that, that kind of a, 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 a situation in which we have been, uh, which, which we have been trapped. Now, this nationalism in Nepal is not a new one. The ultranationalism is not a new one which has an India focus. I think it was started by the monarchy earlier. Its best example could be seen during the 1960s when King Mahindra, because of his own regime changes, wanted to turn it against India and uh, has, has an old history. And that history of politically fanning, of fueling this nationalism has continued to exist even, even today. And uh, therefore, its political content has got to be understood. And secondly, I would say that India has done everything also to reinforce this anti-Indian nationalism by its own foolishness on various counts. And I think one of the important counts where it was that there was a crude, uh, uh, I would say, interference uh, or, or uh, uh, intervention, uh, uh, mostly diplomatically, uh, into the Nepalese affairs. And this again gave a blatant example in 2015 when Nepal had formed its constitution and India wanted, to, wanted that constitution to change when the Constituent Assembly had already approved it. I mean, this is nowhere done. Uh, India would not accept that kind of an intervention. And why should Nepal accept that kind of an intervention? And that was followed by a coercive economic uh, diplomacy, which um, uh, Nepalese call a blockade, Indians call a partial blockade, or uh, regulated economic flow, whatever else it is, which affected ordinary uh, Nepalese and, and made them so vibrantly against India as uh, they appear to be today. And thirdly, India's casual complacency in dealing with Nepal. Frankly speaking, when you sit in Kathmandu, uh, the feeling you get is that uh, Nepal, India is all the time uh, sitting to conspire against Nepal's interests. The fa hard fact is that Indian policymakers hardly have any time to devote to Nepal. They are quite engaged with, uh, with the US, with China, with Europe, uh, with Russia, uh, various other problems, and very little quality time is in fact devoted to shaping uh, Nepal policy. And many times these policies are very ad hoc policies. Many times these policies are a combination of various stakeholders. There are different interests which come and play on India and a and a, what you call a balance is brought about where some interests are neglected, some are not, not neglected. So I would hold India equally responsible for alienating Nepal by some of these actions which have created this problem. And I think third countries have always made use of it. So the second factor to my mind is this distorted nationalism, both in India and Nepal, which is not helping uh, the two countries. And the third factor is, which is the last one, which is the changing regional balance in South Asia. And this is not a factor which is new. In fact, uh, Prithvi Narayan Shah, while talking about Dhungas and Taruls, uh, very clearly defined this kind of a, a regional balance. And he said, Nepal as a small country has to balance itself. Whenever China has been more powerful, Nepal has leaned towards China. Whenever India has been more powerful, Nepal has leaned towards India. This is a strategic game which Nepal has been playing for a long time. 
Now, starting with 50s, that is after 49, the communist China's rise, Nepal uh, had greater, uh, what you call, reliance upon, upon India. So you saw 1950 TTVC, we have seen 50s, 60s, all kind of other developments. Now the regional balance is changing, and the Nepalese find that uh, by playing uh, one against another, they can take economic advantage, they can create a strategic space for them, which is quite legitimate for any small country to do. India did it in relation to Russia and uh, the Western Bloc earlier. India is now doing it in relation to the Western Bloc and China. And I think Nepal is to some extent entitled to. But as a result of this, many of the vital interests which India and Nepal had together are being affected by that. And that's why a lot of tension has crept into India-Nepal relations. So on the whole, I would say these are the three factors where China has come in because of the balance. We can go into details of the China's role in not only India-Nepal, but entire British uh, relationship. And it is because of this that, you know, the Nepali leaderships are now earlier. The Nepali leadership accepted Indian border check posts, military check posts against China for security. Now the Nepali leadership is asking to be a bridge between India and China, and they want a trilateral relationship in a different way. So the things have changed on three counts, as I mentioned to you, and I think we should take account of these three major factors. There are minor factors, other, in order to understand and proceed further with India-Nepal relationship. I think I should conclude here. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Um, you uh, I think what you said is extremely right that people in Nepal and or people in India, I think they need to do more research on each other because especially when we want to have a conference like this on Nepal-India relation, we hardly get 10 faculties or 10 researchers. You have to invite someone who has served in Indian embassy in Kathmandu who has served maybe for one, two or three years. Or we have to find someone who has been a security expert, been to Nepal for three months. So we have to find those kind of people. Uh, we, ha we can hardly find anyone who have done serious research on the two countries, like at least four or five years of horror study on Nepal. Uh, it's so po even, uh, even policy makers have to think seriously, not only the researchers. Anyway, so go ahead. Uh, now we'd like to request Professor Chang Yadong to give his remarks and then we'll uh, continue with the question. Okay, thank you. Oh, sorry. Is it open? Yeah. Yes. So thank you, Paramount, and uh, for your hosting this uh, uh, conference. So I think Professor Mani and uh, what he mentioned is right. Uh, actually, a uh, relationship between China, India, and uh, Nepal is not just a relationship between three sovereign states, sovereign countries, but also relationship between three neighbors, between three Asian peoples. Actually, relationship, engagements, and the interactions between China, Nepal, and India, I think has a long, long history. More than 2,000 years, I think this is a very rare phenomenon in the history of the world. So I think, Professor Mani, you are right. So we can choose friends, but we can choose neighbors. So we must use neighbors relationship perspective when we see, when we study China, India, and Nepal relationship. So my, my presentation will mainly focus on China, India. So I maybe use a uh, 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 screen sharing, is, it is okay? Pramod? Sorry? I think I can you. Muted, muted himself. Unmute yourself, uh, uh, Pramod. Okay, yes, sir, you can share it. Yeah, I can use it, uh, but, but I, I, I'm prohibited in using screen sharing, so. Okay, let me try. Yeah. Can you try now? Okay. No, not ready. Okay, maybe, maybe I just, 
Now you can. Okay. Yeah. Not a, not a necessary. Okay. No, you can now. So, yes. Hello? Professor. Oh, Tom yes. Is, yeah, yes, it's okay. I found it. Is okay? Yes. Hmm? Yes, we can we can view it. Please go ahead. It's okay? Yes. Please start. No problem. I can't find it. Mm -hmm. Okay, I got it. So, so my comment about a matter about the current uh, pandemic situation and its impacts on China, uh, India, relations. And firstly, I want to talk a little bit about the uh, uh, impacts of the pandemic on international relations. So firstly, I, I think uh, the pan pandemic will have little impact on current international structure. Uh, international structure, according to my own uh, definition, it means uh, a structure between uh, powers, between major powers in the world, such as between US, China, and India. So uh, the pandemic's impact on this structure will be very, very, very limited, I think. And, and uh, by the way, it is maybe have another direction of effects, I call it a con concentration of power and affairs, uh, because uh, richer people and it will be much easier to revive to handle the current situation. So, so the pandemic will be very different from financial crisis because financial crisis is a crisis of the rich, crisis of the developed developed countries. So we can see in 2008, after financial crisis, the U.S. lost something and China, India, and many other countries gain lots. But the pandemic situation is very different. It's a crisis of the poor. The crisis is really on the developed countries. Uh, it, even within a country, you can see the poor people, uh, underdeveloped people, and they lost much than the, uh, rather than rich people. So I think after the pandemic, uh, maybe we can see very different uh, uh, tendency and maybe some powers, water power or regional power, will get much more power, even much more, a uh, lot, lot, lot of wealth uh, after the pandemic is the first issue. The second issue, I think the pandemic will have a greater impact on the international order. So order for me is very different from structure. And uh, uh, the first, uh, firstly, globalization is facing a lot of challenges and facing lots of difficulties. So, and the uh, globalization maybe will not stop, but it will be changed much. And the second point is, you know, I, we, we, we already see some mutual isolation and separation between different countries, specifically in international trade and in many other areas, specifically in economic areas. The thirdly, the pandemic and may push up national economic and political nationalism, just as uh, uh, Professor Mani mentioned, and, uh, and even populism, you can see what's going on in US and in lots of countries. So all of this may promote economic uh, regionalization or nationalization rather than uh, in the, in the mm -hmm. country, including China, India, and US may pay more attention uh, to the integrity of its own production and chain. So uh, anyway, I think uh, uh, globalization process will not stop here, but it may be uh, transformed because in the past, globalization means uh, US-centric, uh, the Western world-centric, uh, and in the future, we will see a lot of the multipolar or multi-centered uh, uh, new globalization process maybe. But uh, uh, anyway, most of global rules in the national uh, norms and the rules will continue to be effective. But uh, in some cases, in some area, and some rules and some multilateral uh, uh, organizations will be weakened and, uh, and, uh, is, uh, after the pandemic. The second part, I want to say something about the current China uh, India relations, relations. And a lot of people, about, including in China side, in Indian side, 
and lots of people might focus on some negative side of current China-India relationship, uh, relevant to pandemic issue, relevant to border dispute issue. But, uh, but actually, our country relationship is not so bad, which they can find a lot of good issue. Uh, currently, China-India relationship continue a traditional parallel, par par parallel principle. It means even we can see lots of contradictions and comp competition in some areas, specifically in uh, board duties, but we still can see lots of cooperation and coordination in other areas, such as uh, international issues and the international arena. So, so the first study, both China and uh, India uh, insist in some issues, uh, and uh, specifically I mentioned the border issues and many uh, other uh, issues, uh, frankly, and both China and India, we have our own uh, we have our own something uh, position. And uh, for example, and India has a lot of advantage in actual control. So we can see India ha has insisted that we should uh, demarcation LOC for many, many years. But China, uh, China side has uh, uh, advantage in infrastructure construction. So China is not a very active in, in demarcation of LOC, but uh, we are very active uh, to try to try to build uh, a uh, code of conduct for both sides is to come to have different uh, uh, position. Uh, but I think both sides have, have, anyway, and we, we even have lots of difference between two countries in some other issues, such as in CPAC, CPAC in ICP, and many others. But, uh, but uh, China and uh, India, we also maintain a basic strategy. I call it the multilateral balance. And you also can see the kind of uh, new kind of non-alignment policy even today. So, and uh, in, in China side, a lot of Chinese worried very much about India's strategic position, specifically, and some people worry India is tilting into uh, US side and maybe become another ally of the United States. But the, personally, I think India has expressed, even has expressed its attention to join US-led in Indo Pacific washing, not, not a strategy, maybe strategic washing. But uh, India is also emphasize a very important issue. This Indo Pacific should be inclusive, not exclusive. And it's very different from uh, US washing. And uh, India even does not uh, include China's possible participation. So it's very different from US washing. And in China side, China also maintain balance between. Uh, India and Pakistan between cooperation and uh, competition. So I think both China's and uh, India's foreign policy are here today are balanced uh, and uh, moderate uh, and neutral for many issues. And, uh, and even China and India continually consider and care each other's emotions and uh, some uh, sensitive issues. And in the Indian side, India still care China's sensitive issue such as in Tibetan issue, the Rama issue, Xinjiang issue, Taiwan issue. And uh, I have never seen any Indian state people, national leaders say any, uh, any negative issue about this China's uh, sensitive issue. And for China, China also, and I think the India some returns, and China cares, India's concerns on terror issue, on China-Pakistan relationship, and the trade issue, and even uh, for many other issues. So, and the cooperation between China and India in Shanghai Cooperation Organization and in AIIB and, and in many other international areas are continue. I think uh, still smoothly. And uh, this year very different because this year pandemic issue uh, is still there here. So a lot of issues stop. Stop just doesn't mean finish. So, but uh, we also worry one issue. It's really true, it is very uh, time, very easy to have a uh, conflict. So it's for China, India, we must uh, take uh, care about this. Because currently you can see in, in, in Indian side, and anti-China sentiments is on, on the rise. So we can see lots of uh, criticism, lots of uh, stigma of China uh, are also on the rise. And some people in India and they may try to utilize China's current difficulties. And we have lots of issues with some countries, with the US, with other countries. And in, in China's side, and many people also has a similar feeling 
of being besieged, contained, and treated badly by some other countries. So it may regard the may regard some normal misunderstanding. I say misunderstanding some sometimes are normal. It's very easy for understanding each other. So internationally, misunderstanding, misperception is a normal issue. But some people may be regarded this kind of normal issue as a hostility and uh, some normal conflicts, normal disputes uh, as a part uh, of US uh, uh, containment of China. So it's a very and deteriorate situation in, in, in both sides. So I think uh, we, we must get some, some something from the past, uh, we shouldn't let uh, history uh, repeat itself. And uh, I think no China, neither China nor India gain anything from the past, uh, specifically from conflicts and even specifically uh, uh, military conflicts. So how to, how to handle, how to handle. So, so China, India, including Nepal, our relationship, not just the relationship between Nation states. Nation states, sovereign states, is uh, is an Asian concept. Is not an Asian uh, political term. And uh, in Asian history, and the people between our two countries, between two three regions, is is Asian. It's a historical long issue. As I don't think two thousand years ago, we can see a name of we call we can call it uh, China. We we can find a name. We can call it Nepal. And in Asian time, we have a different name. So, so I say, maybe we should have a new approach to handle some issue, to, to pursue each other. And I call it a people-centric with global perspective approach. So, you know, people's life need three elements, civilization, security, and the economy. So civilization is not in our hand, it's in our you know, predecessor's hand, and we just the heritage from our uh, uh, predecessors. The security is a nation state's duty. And what we can do is economy. Maybe we, we must do everything to improve economic situation for people, not just for nation states. The economy for country, and, and it's a little bit different from the economy for people. And in some country, economy is very good, but not very good for people, specifically for poor people. So, so we should have a people-oriented approach. We should follow people's voice. We should obey the market's mechanism. So, so, and uh, we can use this ap approach to transcend, uh, transcend the concept of nation states. And uh, so, it should be very easy to see, uh, to view China India uh, relationship. And uh, maybe much easier to solve problems between China and India, uh, some problem finally. So, actually, if we just uh, uh, throw, uh, just the uh, 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 in the perspective of nation states, it should be very, very hard for China, India, even for, for, for India and Nepal, it's very hard to solve some issues, specifically for border issue, for territory uh, disputes. It's very sensitive, very easy to, to, to stir uh, na nationalist sentiments. It's very, 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 very hard to, to help. So I, I do believe the marketing economy is, is far more powerful force than states and army, than policies. Than policy. Sometimes maybe we worry too much, and the uh, policymakers maybe they are saying so much. We should just answer people, common people. So, the so final point I want to say a little bit about Nepal. So, what Nepal can do between China and uh, and uh, India? So, Nepal is a Himalayan country, and Nepal is not the only strategic buffer room between China and India. And in the future, Nepal should become a bridge between China and India. So, China and Nepal. India corridor is just an initiative, just some proposal. And I think it's very necessary, it's very possible. And uh, if, if we can build this kind of three countries corridor, it will not only change Himalaya, but also will change the psychological cognition between two countries. Because sometimes the physical border is also a kind of psychological border between people. If we can build a, a kind of uh, a, a corridor, a connection, physical connection, and can overcome Himalaya, so, and the people in three countries, when, when they see each other, will be very, very different. But frankly, you know, 20 years ago, I, I come from China's Anhui province. You know, 20 years ago, people in my hometown, when they see people in Shanghai, it's very different. 
not very different, very, very different. And people in Shanghai and in their perspective, people in Anfei is all very different. Very, different, very interesting. But today it's totally different. Today and uh, we have high speed uh, high, high speed train and we, we can have uh, lunch in Shanghai, then we can have dinner in Hefei and linked by high speed train. So the cognition between Shanghai and my hometown Anhui have been changed totally, have been changed very much. So I do believe a physical connection, a physical corridor between China, Nepal, and India, if we can build it, it will be very, very useful for three countries, not, a ju not just for transportation, not just for economic uh, uh, interest, it's also uh, for 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 first the country, the people to destroy to overcome the the border, uh, psych psychological border, psychological barrier between three country the peoples. So uh, I I want to stop here. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Jiadong. Now I would like to invite Dr. Deepa Prakashpata. Uh, thank you, Pramod. Uh, thank you, the team NICE and Dr. Pramod uh, have been doing uh, a great contribution during the COVID-19 effect regarding the Nepal-India-China relation and a person not only regarding the, these three countries, but he is actively connecting the scholars, politicians and civil society or the media regarding the Nepal's discourse and how to intervene in uh, the pandemic policies. And despite that, he is actively linking and networking scholars, politicians, and media persons in uh, Nepal-India relation. And of course, Nepal-China relation and China-India-Nepal relation, all these uh, two uh, bilateral and the trilateral, uh, one can say, in a, in a multilateral forum. So as Professor Muni <coughs> mentioned about Nepal, China, India relations. Uh, broadly, he has put the problems and in integrity and the challenges and how the young, young people in the countries are looking for the future relations. And especially when it comes to the government to government relation. And at the same time, we see it people to people relation because millions are crossing border in day-to-day -day basis. And if you look at the pandemic situation, then it's different between Nepal and India. We can see that stranded people coming back from India to Nepal. And of course, similarly, though not uh, in the similar size, but a uh, uh, very uh, big number in Nepal border to enter India. And there is a question of that, you know, how we are handling the situation, one, at the moment. And Professor Jia Dong, as you rightly put that how the changing context, not only the nation state notion of relations between these three countries where Nepal lies between two different political systems, two different civilizations, but it interconnect its entreport to both of the civilizations in both different political systems. And uh, we can see that at the moment, Nepal Communist Party is the ruling party here, but that doesn't mean that what Indian media and uh, very you know, in a, in a manner that all the things, initiations taken by the government with the content of the, all the political parties, the all, you know, the issues discussed at the all party level and the conclusion drawn by all party mechanism or, you know, like that way uh, has been said that everything Nepal is pursuing on behalf of the China or something like that, you know, the, something like that. So this is how superficial conclusions have been drawn and what i see that uh, the people to people relation has been recognized time and again in india china relation of course in india nepal relation and of course nepal china relation as we see that at the moment as himalaya has set the boundary between nepal and china we have a peace and friendship treaty uh, signed in 1960 after 10 years with india and in each and every moment we see that India have a, a legacy of the British colonial era. And in Nepal, as we always say that we were independent and having different link and the ruling 
mentality or having close relation with the British rulers or the British India era is with there. So everything uh, we cannot just analyze keeping all these things in mind because we are living in the age of the digital democracy or the cyber democracy. Almost the youth, 80% youth and 60% total population uh, in Nepal have, a uh, have a access to the digital activities, you know, the cyber activities, what is happening, what is happening in the uh, social media, the ministry media and everywhere. So. Uh, they can talk about uh, what president have said or mentioned, what prime minister is doing, what opposition leader is doing, and what their representative at the ward level, provincial level, at the federal level is doing. So it is a word. Everywhere this is happening. It's because they are putting pressure to do right or wrong things. And at the same time, I will recall that each and every country has its national principles while defining the national interest of that particular country. So similarly, Nepal has done, and with the past change in the political system in the last seven decades, with the political instability, not even a single government, during even the stable, the Panchayat era, have served for its tenure, four to five years, whatever we call it, five years to tenure. So if that could happen for the, this government will be for the first time in the Nepalese political history. So. All people are looking from that perspective, one, you know, it's internal dimension. And while calling from the, like China, Nepal, India, or whatever we put forward alphabetically, geographically, Nepal, China, India, in between, Nepal can harness from the benefit, both India and China, you know, like uh, 95 billion trade they have done last year. And that we can see and analyze what was the situation in 2000, that was 3 billion and it was at par on both sides, but now we can see the trade deficit and all the things happening. So uh, in, for Nepal, it is only like uh, 8.7 billion total trade with China. And after that, we have a deficit. And India side, we have a, our randomly 80% trade and trade deficit is clear. Uh, I'm not going into the economic you know, interpretation of the relation uh, very uh, uh, pointingly that, but in general, what we have seen that, you know, the, when uh, Indian Prime Minister Modi visited Nepal in 2015, and that period, we can see that, you know, he was welcomed in the streets, in the parliament, everywhere. People were saying, well, we have a very good friend. And soon after that, after, uh, you know, it was after, uh, and people remember that, the action, what he has made soon after the earthquake and uh, after the promulgation of constitution, which was drafted through a democratic process. So there was, and after a long time, Xi Jinping, Chinese president, visited last year, and people have a same gesture, like, you know, same means, like, you know, again, the very good gesture for his visit and uh, China-Nepal relations. Now, what I see is that Nepal is a, in a, moving in the right direction with its own national capability and with its all national conscience, with its national principles, defining its national uh, uh, interests. So it's not that we are opening trade routes up to the China's uh, sea, uh, I mean, uh, ports. It's, it's not a uh, China card. We see it as a, our right, being a landlocked country. And so the uh, dry ports and the sea ports in China is again that it could have not been possible that if India could have, uh, shouldn't have posted that blockade. So again, thanks to India, we call. So, but, uh, but in a general uh, a tendency here that it is not that anti-India sentiment. It did that, it's pro-Nepali, and whenever Indian side or the politicians, scholars, or those who are working seriously on these relations are very few people. Today morning, uh, I was looking at the uh, master's thesis that a young, person was doing that, you know, how Indian migrants are working and living and how their relations are with Nepalese. So it was, uh, it was fascinating conclusion that he didn't find anybody that from Indian side is contributing in that particular study. So then I gave some, uh, you know, the links I have, but the scholars, young scholars, when they look, I know that this relation, they don't find anything seriously dealt on. So this is where the academicians, this is where that we have seen a very 
a prominent journalist in Indian TV is talking about everything bullshit that's happening that 2,000 or 200, uh, you know, the Chinese hackers are every day uh, siphoning the Nepalese money or, uh, from the banks or hacking the Nepalese sites, something like that and limiting to that. And what happening is that uh, in Nepal, we see that, yes, it's changing as the world is changing. Uh, facing the COVID-19, we have seen that. We have said that Susta and Limpia Dura Kalapani area is unsettled uh, boundary area. So let that should be discussed in the formal mechanisms, but India unilaterally said that uh, and developed the road in that part. Of course, that is Nepalese territory. So we are putting forward our uh, historical facts, maps, and the people living in those areas have said that and they have uh, the, all the documents. So that is another issue that between uh, India and Nepal. And without much going into that uh, detail in that particular event, because we are talking about the trilateral possibilities and the uh, 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 relations between three countries. So Nepal is already to have a very cordial relation with both the global power or the global economy, I mean, the world's large, uh, second or third largest economies uh, in terms of power purchasing parity. So I think uh, I will stop here and I will be happy to respond any query or question regarding uh, my presentation. Thank you, Pramod. <coughs> Dr. Bhatt, may I now request Dr. Uh, Professor B. R. Deepak make his presentation? Uh, thank you, Pramod, uh, for uh, you know, bringing all the people together. It's uh, nice to see uh, friends from China, Professor uh, Tong Chia Tung and Professor Lin Min Wang here. Uh, it's uh, quite a nice glimpse, you know, that. Uh, well, I will uh, uh, focus on. Uh, you know, a couple of points, uh, but my premise, uh, it is uh, based on the narrative of uh, emerging India, you know, so that was based on uh, robust economic growth and its ability and capacities to handle domestic and international crises. I think uh, that had entered unpredictability, you know, because uh, uh, Professor Muni said that, you know, India and India is emerging and I, yes, there is no doubt about it. I think uh, in the last couple of years, so we have seen the slump in the growth rates and uh, not to talk about this uh, COVID-19 crisis. So I see uh, this, you know, entering, especially emergence of India entering unpredictability at, at least in the, you know, uh, uh, short term, uh, not in the long term. So we'll see how things fall. In. And it is important in this context, you know, to uh, see the kind of uh, equilibrium and understanding, and understanding India is seeking with China, you know, uh, China's response you know, towards these understanding of India, you know, it's not difficult to gauge. So it is in this background, I'll make a couple of uh, points. So one uh, uh, in, 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 in uh, relation to the ongoing uh, border standoff between India and China, and trade and investment, and finally maybe a little bit about the neighborhood, where I will uh, make a little bit, uh, uh, you know, uh, of what Professor Muni and uh, Professor Tang uh, Jiatong so they spoke about. So as far as border standoff is concerned, uh, you know there is a debate in India as well as in China that the consensus. So here I may disagree with Professor Chang that the consensus, you know, which was reached in 1993 and especially later during uh, Wuhan summit and in, in Chennai Connect, I think that I see somewhere eroding and, and, and that is acceptability of this point in Chinese scholarship and also, you know, in India, especially at this point in time, various things are making rounds. Professor Chang talk about, uh, you know, India's coziness with the United States. Uh, India, you know, joining uh, more than 100 countries, you know, to ask for investigation into coronavirus origin. And then China not been happy with the abrogation of Article 370. And of course, you know, India, India's opposition to CPAC and not being on board with China's BRI. I think these are some of the things which, uh, uh, which, which undermine the kind of consensus in you know, both leaders. So they have reached, uh, and, and, uh, and I, I see that 
So this will continue to uh, erode. Uh, there may be some logic in these arguments. You know, however, I believe that the standoff you know, along the border is not one of the incidents, and it reflects the continuity you know, of uh, the Chinese positions uh, in the border areas. So why I'm saying that, you know, number one, because China has an easy access to the line of actual control, uh, and it can uh, patrol and even deploy forces in the rear quite easily. So this is one thing. And second is China, as Professor Chang said, that it doesn't favor the identification of line of actual control because it opens up a can of worms according to them. And, and of course, I believe that this uh, also gives China a great uh, maneuverability you know, as far as controlling line of actual control is concerned. And once you know, China inches in, uh, so it uh, consolidates its position and seeks diplomatic solution to the problem as you know, we have witnessed, whether it is in 2013, 2014, and now. You know, of course, this is you know, one of the perceptions from Indian side. Therefore, you know, putting all the things together, I believe uh, you know, border or the resolution of border as such is not a top priority for China. But this creates problem, you know, because having ramped up its infrastructure along, uh, across the line of actual control, and when India does the same, so that means the capabilities, the capacities of both accessing line of actual control, they are greatly enhanced. And this will cause the friction, this is called, uh, uh, will, will cause conflict, as we have witnessed, you know, uh, uh, witnessed uh, recently. So therefore, uh, my suggestion, you know, would be that these uh, mechanisms, so which uh, we have established since 1993, uh, they are not working, uh, you know, well as far as resolution of the border is concerned. So it is just, I think, good enough for managing, or uh, Professor Tang says uh, that, you know, uh, it is, like sort of conduct of code, uh, code of conduct as far as uh, the managing border is concerned. It's not, uh, uh, it's, it's not aimed at resolving the border. So my suggestion would be India and China. So they would be looking uh, for exploring another mechanism, a stronger mechanism, you know, uh, having more political teeth, uh, which will reopen the package deal, I still believe that you know, package deal is the only uh, way to resolve the problem. So we should be seriously looking into it. Otherwise, the kind of fait comply India is uh, throwing to China or China is throwing to India, it will never work out. You know, these will be sort of like two parallel lines never meeting uh, on the ground. So this was as far as border conflict is concerned. And second is trade and investment. In uh, so here, uh, especially under present circumstances, I think uh, uh, the disruption of the global supply chains, uh, it has given rise to two sentiments in India. So one is as explained by Prime Minister Modi, you know, this Atam Dirbhar Bharat, self-reliance. And of course, it is also uh, found up by some of the organizations like Swadeshi Jagran Manch. In fact, recently, if you are taking a note of their activities, so they have launched one Swadeshi self-reliance campaign from uh, May 25th. And the very first article of this campaign is boycott of Chinese goods. Uh, and since then, we will see that uh, an app, this Remove China app, which has seen millions of downloads in India, you know, it has been removed by Google of late. Uh, second uh, sentiment, you know, related to this is India as an alternative global supply chain destination, which I think uh, is a bit of exaggeration, is a bit of daydreaming, I would see, I, I will see, because I believe that it took China 40 years to develop uh, these supply chains, 
you know, by inviting massive foreign direct investments. And the two principles which I think everyone, or, or rather the two gaps which everyone should be filling up, primarily the developing country, uh, that of domestic saving gap and foreign exchange reserve gap. You know. So these were done away with China. And as a result, you know, it's been able to, 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 uh, to, to become the manufacturing of the world. So contrary to this, I think in India, my Chinese friends, they, they must have noticed that on 17th of April, so we announced a new FDI policy. And many of my Chinese friends, they said that, you know, it is targeted at China. It is to shun China out of the Indian markets. Uh, at surface, I think it would uh, look pretty much the same, but uh, I don't think, uh, you know, so India uh, would be shunting our Chinese investment uh, uh, from, uh, from, 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 from its uh, uh, land. Why I'm, saying, why I'm saying so, you know, consider this. So one, even during the, you know, COVID period, the kind of, uh, companies which are registering in, in, in India. So they are, the process is going on. And, and, I'm, uh, I, I, and I know that some of the companies, so they have already been you know, registered. The certificate of corporation has been given to them. And they can do everything, you know, including foreign direct investment. So had India you know, planning to restrict Chinese foreign investment, I think India would not have allowed the registration of these companies amidst COVID-19. Uh, this is one. And second is, I think, in the, uh, Chinese companies, especially as far as the startups are concerned, you know, out of 30 new startups of India, so 18 are started with the Chinese investment. In, and there are even more. In. And second, I believe that uh, the China's uh, relocation of its labor-intensive industry, so it will continue in, and it will continue uh, to uh, find ways into Southeast Asia as it has already, uh, already been, been, been uh, uh, doing in uh, uh, Myanmar, in uh, Thailand, in uh, Vietnam, and so on and so forth. I think in uh, South Asia also. So India is one of the favorite destination for Chinese investment. And we can see the kind of supply chains, you know, so they have transferred to India, relocated to India. Noida, you know, adjacent to Delhi, it has become the hub of uh, mobile telephony supply chain. And uh, uh, Pune, so it has become supply chain for uh, home appliance uh, equipment, uh, white household goods. And Chennai for electronics. And uh, uh, Hyderabad and Bangalore, you know, for these optical fiber cables and uh, solar cells. So already many of the supply chains, so they have already been you know, shifted to India and they have been localized. So I think this will go on. And as a result, we see, we see that there are more than 2000 Chinese companies registered in India. Of course, not all of them. So they are maybe doing business, the kind of business the mobile uh, telephone is doing. But I, I, I can say that around 700 to 800 companies, so they are very, very active in India. Uh, and, and, and I believe that the new policies which uh, Indian government has uh, uh, initiated, announced uh, of establishing you know, a new world uh, telephone manufacturing facility with an investment of 6.6 .6 billion, uh, though they have not named the, uh, the, the, the the, the players, but I'm sure that at least one or two Chinese players, so they would also be uh, taking uh, part in that. And obviously, uh, you know, there are various other, uh, other, other, other projects which are going on. Uh, for example, in energy sector, in um, pharmaceutical industry, and uh, also in automobile sectors. Uh, but I think uh, uh, this, uh, the, the, the post-COVID, uh, uh, India-China relations would see, you know, the reactivation of these investment plans because uh, Great Wall Motors, you know, so they have uh, uh, said that they will invest one billion US dollars in India, and uh, MG Motors, so they uh, are investing around 650 million dollars in Indian market. In, in fact, they are already they have already started to sell 
their cards. So it remains, you know, very, very lucrative uh, market uh, for, for, for China. And for India, I think uh, China also remains one of the source, one of the sources uh, to attract foreign uh, direct investment. So I don't think, you know, this uh, uh, shifting or decoupling of the uh, of, of, of American economy with China, you know, it is uh, going to impact uh, too much on India, or maybe India is uh, dreaming that this decoupling will, uh, will, will, will make India as a haven for investment. I think uh, we should not uh, be too enthusiastic about that because we have uh, our own problems. We need to reform labors, uh, we, labor laws. We need to you know, uh, uh, have drastic reforms in land acquisition policy. And then only, I think, you know, we would be able to attract some more uh, investment, and not only from China, but also from various other countries, those who would like to decouple from uh, China. My final point uh, is about India-China, uh, you know, in the neighborhood. I think uh, India uh, has to live up with the, uh, uh, with the, the reality, uh, and that is the economic asymmetry you know, in the region between India and China. Because uh, the, 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 the way China is making inforage in our neighborhood, it is understandable. You know. The way BRI has been extended uh, around us, it is also understandable because it's extremely lucrative you know, for uh, smaller countries in the vicinity. Uh, and we can see if you compare the kind of investment China has done in these countries, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, Nepal, Pakistan, you know. So it is huge. It is, uh, it, it comes around, you know, 70, 80 billion US dollars. And can India match this kind of investment, you know, in, 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 in this area or in uh, other area, I would say Asia Pacific, uh, Indo-Pacific or, you know, in, in, in other areas which is trying to uh, forge uh, uh, you know, uh, you can say uh, 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 relationship with other uh, players. What India should be doing, as far as uh, you know, neighborhood concern, neighborhood is concerned. Uh, number one, I believe that India should be unfolding a workable connectivity strategy in the neighborhood. And in this regard, uh, the policies unfolded by India, like Bharat Mala and Sagar Mala, you know, they should not be. Uh, mere slogans, I think they should be uh, put on the ground and various tributaries, you know, from these should be extending, extend, extended to our neighborhood. I think then only uh, the regional connectivity, it will have certain uh, value as far as economic integration and people to people uh, 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 interaction is concerned. And secondly, I think India uh, at the same time need to uh, to, to take the lead uh, in strengthening strategic and economic partnership with the, our neighborhood, be it SARC or be it BIMSTAC, ASEAN. And for this, I think we really need to be, uh, be, be, be bold enough you know, to join various initiatives like BCIM with uh, China and RCEP, uh, which is important you know, as far as our, uh, our, our connectivity with Southeast Asia is concerned. So third, I think we really need to be magnanimous in its approach uh, and stop scoring self goals. I think we have scored enough self goals as far as our neighborhood is concerned. Professor Muni has already uh, mentioned some of them. And uh, we have not really uh, you know, lived up to the expectations of our neighbor. For example, the projects uh, which were signed with Nepal in, uh, during 90s, they are still pending. You know. I mean, if this is the situation, naturally, uh, you know, your neighbor, they will not have uh, the kind of trust uh, which, you, uh, which, which you want them to repose anyway. And third, I agree with Professor Muni that, you know, this special relationship, it is part of the problem, you know, as far as, special, as, far as relationship with Nepal is concerned. We really need to uh, look into that. And uh, if... Uh, need be, we really need to revisiting, uh, revisit all the treaties in the previous treaties and open up negotiation afresh. We should not be, uh, you know, shying away from negotiating. 
uh, finally, I think, uh, you know, if India would like to, uh, to, 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 uh, uh, to have uh, a better understanding and our, uh, you know, strong economic partnership and connectivity with the, uh, our, our neighbors, including China, uh, I think India really need to focus on its uh, uh, economic drivers, its political drivers. Uh, and once so they are strong, I think some kind of balance, you know, it would automatically be, uh, be, 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 uh, be, be, be there. So with this, I, uh, I, I'll stop here. I'll take any questions, so which, uh, uh, you know, uh, audience would like to, uh, to, to pose. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. May I now request Professor Lemin Wang to make his presentation? Maybe uh, we can sp uh, spend more time during questions. So may I request him to be brief as we're running out of time? Okay. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, thank you. Thank you for, for Dr. Promot. And uh, uh, my my remark uh, will be uh, focused on the recent China-Nepal relations and also uh, talking about the Indian factors between China-Nepal relations. Uh, you know, uh, under the COVID-19 pa pandemic, uh, actually uh, China-Nepal relations has achieved uh, progress, stable progress. You know, uh, President Xi uh, make a telephone call uh, with the President Bandalis of Nepal. And also uh, he stressed that uh, China was thankful for Nepal's strong support. And also for Nepal demonstrate the deep friendship towards China's. And also he mentioned that uh, after the defeat of COVID-19, uh, two sides should continue the, the agreement which was uh, made uh, last year. And also, uh, you know, uh, Chinese Foreign Minister Wang Yi has made telephone call with his counterpart of the Nepal twice. On the contrary, you can see it's quite uh, interesting. You can find President Xi never made any call to Prime Minister Modi. And uh, you know, uh, President Xi have a telephone call with the German Prime Minister uh, three times, with France President two times, and also even with uh, United States President Trump one, one time. So it's very interesting. Uh, President Xi has made a call to all the South Asian countries except India and the Bhutan, of course, Bhutan. We, uh, China and Bhutan did not have uh, diplomatic relations. Uh, why? And uh, I guess maybe uh, the main reason uh, was because when the COVID-19 pandemic was uh, broke out in Wuhan, and the Indian side had, has never shown any uh, friendship uh, towards the Chinese side. Uh, so, it's not because of the uh, standoff in, uh, in the borders. You know, the border issues, be before the border issues, actually, uh, President Xi has made a call to many South Asian countries leaders. So, uh, for, uh, now I attend to uh, China-Nepal relations. I would say uh, uh, for, for, for China-Nepal relations last year, uh, the, the President Xi made a, a visit, the stay visit for President Xi is very important because uh, in Chinese media, we're talking about uh, uh, China-Nepal relations has been lifted to a new height. And also when President Xi in Nepal, in Kathmandu, we signed a 20 uh, agreement which covers many, many areas. And also the, the, the two uh, president announced that China and Nepal strategic partners of the cooperation, which link even lasting friendship for development and the prosperity. 
So uh, this is one of the, uh, from the political side, we have upgraded the strategy of friendship. And the, on the second aspect, I think uh, also, the, the, the high line is the connectivity between China and Nepal, which has been made for several years. Because uh, when Nepal joined the BRI initiate, and, uh, and also because of the Indians blockage of the Nepal, so uh, Nepal turned to China for, for the uh, connectivity initiate. So now two sides have been accelerated the building of the Chance Himalaya multi-dimension connectivity network. And uh, they have many plans such as park, highway, railway, and aviation and communication. Uh, I will not go, de go into the details. Uh -huh. And uh, why uh, now we can have a new stage for China-Nepal relation? I think the, the first reason is because now Nepal has finished your political transformation and you actually face a new opportunity for stability and development. Actually, Nepal's government has invited Chinese leaders to visit Nepal several times. Why last year, uh, President Xi decided to, to, to pay a, a visit? I think because for Chinese side, we saw Nepal has found your way and you um, become more and more stable in your domestic policy. This is the main factors. And another uh, the second factor is, is uh, I have been uh, talking about that. Uh, this, this topic is China's new South Asia policies. Since President Xi took office, actually China was more active in its new uh, in its South Asia policies. You can see uh, Chinese leaders has paid visit to all the South Asian countries. It's quite different from the previous uh, Chinese uh, leaders. You know, uh, when in the previous uh, government, Chinese government, the Prime Minister Wen Jiabao and also President Hu Jintao, they always uh, with the uh, ASEAN countries. Actually, I can say uh, South Chinese leaders do not pay such important tension to South Asia. But after the President Xi took office, China changed, China becomes more active in its South Asia policies. Why China changed? I think the main issues, the main aim for Chinese is to seek a stable and also peaceful neighboring in its south part. Because the, when the United States adopts the, the, the pivot to Asian policies in Chinese south, in south part of China and also in the east part of China, they are all along the United States alliance, South Korea, Japan, Philippines, and the Thailand, and even we can say Singapore and also Australia. So we see the pivot to Asian policy like some kinds of containment policies. So after the, the Chinese new government took office, we want to seek a more stable, more peaceful neighboring uh, environment, especially in South Asia. Uh, this is uh, the reason why China tried to uh, promote uh, BRI initiated in South Asia, and also want to have a more big seat in South Asia issues. But uh, oh, we, you, you, you know, uh, Indians was uh, very negative towards China's change. Uh, China, Indians did not uh, accept, did not join BRI, and also uh, the Modi government become more and more close 
uh, United States. So this is the situation China should face in its uh, policy. And the last point I want to mention about the Indian factor between China and Nepal relation. Uh, India is very important in China's policy towards South Asia because India is the natural hegemon in this region. So uh, we are very clear about that. So when Modi visited China in 2050, President Xi proposed uh, we can have a trilateral uh, mecha uh, cooperation mechanism such as China, India, Nepal economic corridor, such as China, India, uh, 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 Sri Lanka economic corridors, some kind. But when China uh, make the, the, the concrete plans for the trilateral uh, economic cooperation to Indian side, but we uh, Chinese side never get any response from Indian side. So this is a problem. Why uh, China, after three years later, China now more and more focus on bilateral economic relations with the other South Asian countries. And the, as a general, uh, my personal uh, perception is that uh, actually for Nepalese they have a much better uh, perception uh, uh, with, with China than India. Uh, the main problem is India has always shown big brothers attitudes towards the Nepal, even towards uh, the, the Bhutan and other countries. And also uh, just now, uh, some of the panelists have mentioned India has been repeatedly use you uh, its geography advantage to block the path. So uh, this is maybe is the main reasons why actually uh, Nepal try to find, try to uh, turn to Beijing to find the help for connectivity with the Tibet. And another reason I think which was prom promote China Nepal relations is because uh, the Nepal side always, always stand firm in its upholding the one China policy and also was carefree to, to deal with the, uh, the, the, the Tibetan in exercise. Yeah, and also the separate activity against China in the past. It's compared to Indian side. You, you have a Dalai Lama and also uh, some of the uh, groups who was very active. And also, uh, I would also like to mention the Indo-Pacific strategy. Uh, Professor Zhang has mentioned that Actually, India now was more and more closely follow United States into Pacific strategy. But for Nepal, Nepal seems like too far away from the geopolitical competition between China and United States. So that will make China more comfortable with its relation with Nepal. And also, uh, last year when I visited Nepal, I, I I find Nepal also concerned about uh, China-Indian relation. And many Nepal scholars have mentioned about the China-Indian plus cooperation. Mm -hmm. uh, Nepal has the want to be the bridge between China and India. But uh, Nepal do not want to be the uh, China-Indian plus, do not want to be plus. Uh, I really uh, understand. Yeah. And now, um, actually, if we want to have a very sound trilateral relation, actually, I always advise the Nepal friends that Nepal maybe should learn some uh, experience yeah, from, uh, from Kazakhstan or Mongolia. Actually, Kazakhstan Mongolia was uh, very active in, in, in connecting China and the Russia's 
economy relation. So I think I should stop here. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Levy Wang. Before you open the floor, I just want to make a few comments. I'm a little bit on the aid between China and India and the competition and the changing trend. Uh, like when we compare Chinese aid versus Indian aid, because I got provoked when Professor Bali was telling that the Indian projects are not being fulfilled since 1990. I think it's much beyond that. Uh, so I want to just make a very brief comparison. Like if you compare Chinese aid versus Indian aid, Chinese aid are visible. They will make everything very big at the center, which everyone can locate. For example, uh, Samidhan Sabha in Nepal, the parliament building, or you can say uh, the civil hospitals or the ring road, everyone, it's visible, which is not like India. India do not strategize their uh, uh, aid properly. Similarly, in terms of objective, Chinese aid are very object, objective oriented. Either it has to serve the security will, a security interest or the goodwill of the people. Like people should say, oh, in China is a good neighbor or it should serve China's own interest with security. While Indians, they, they, when Modiji comes to Nepal, they come with uh, maybe one tons of Chandan to Prasupati or they'll say, let's have the uh, Bhagavati cleaning project. These are important, but it's not objective oriented. Or when the president of India comes, he comes with the gifts. Uh, Independence Day of India, they come with 20 ambulances to their favorites. So there's no proper objective behind the Indian aid. Similarly, in terms of perception, perception is what people feel, but it might be not real. In terms of perception, Nepalese feel that Chinese aid really benefit Nepal, not China. While it's not the same with India, when Indian come with aid, they say, oh, maybe India want the market in inner mountains, or maybe they want cheaper labor from uh, the inner mountains. So there's, there's a thing that India really need to work, which is perception management. Uh, Professor Bali rightly pointed the delivery that when Chinese promises certain projects, it's on time, except few projects. But Indian projects are not only delayed since 1990, there are some which are even delayed since 1950. The Hulak, Hulak the coastal uh, highways are very, very old uh, promises of India, which has not been fulfilled. Uh, second is that when you look at the amount of money that has been provided to Nepal, in 2010, it was three times higher than China. India used to provide three times more than what China used to spend in Nepal. But last year, it was it was 50 times more than what India spent in Nepal. So, so that's a big change in the last 10 years that we have to keep in mind. Now, let me briefly come to competition. Like India-China competition is not very new in Nepal. Right after 1963, uh, 62 war, when China and Nepal wanted to have Kodari, Highway India has objections until 2015, till blockade. That was the only opening to, uh, to China. Uh, even before that, like uh, when Nepal wanted to have Birganj Pathaya Road, which connects Nepal to India, which is the gateway to India. Like Birganj is known as gateway to Nepal, or you can say gateway to India for Nepal. So when it was Chinese who first proposed it, where was India at the time? India did not realize that they should have a road to gateway to Nepal. It was Chinese who came with the proposal and then India said, no, 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 how can we allow Chinese? We just had a war. They might keep weapons on the road. So they, they objected it and finally it was made by India. The same story is with, is with Banbasa Kuholpur Road. The, uh, Nepal wanted to construct that road with Nepalese expenditure. There was free bidding. Chinese got the bidding. Finally, China started construction. India ob objected to it. India had to pay fine to Chinese companies and India made it for free. So why they had to come at that later stage? So it's this response, this reactionary response of India is not new. They have done in the past that they, they do not remember, but they rise at crisis. So I think these things have to be resolved. Uh, there, are major, uh, there are major competition, like when the Chinese investor goes to Mustang, the Indian investor goes, when it, so these kind of reactions are there. Uh, I still remember traveling by railway from my village to Jayanagar. And that disappeared, that disappeared. Right now it's not there. And then Chinese come with the dream, the railway dream. And then India arrives and they say, oh no, no, we should have a railway connections. And, and India announced connecting railway at six points. In five, 10 years, it's almost 10 years. When I was working in IDS in 2008, I had heard about these stories and it's 2020. Chinese would have connected from Beijing to Kathmandu in that eight, 10 years. So what happens, uh, that, is, that is the major problem that is there between the two countries. When there is BRI, there is BIMSTEC. When there is Chinese railway story, again, then there is Rakshol, uh, Kathmandu. 
So I think that particular attitude, attitude I think China, uh, India need to change. Now, what are the changing trends? I think in the past, people used to say that China look at Nepal through the government, they have pro-establishment policy, but I think things are changing. In recent times, there are media reports of in Chinese interventions. There are media reports that there was Chinese role in formation of Nepal Communist Party. There was Chinese role in uh, protecting the split of the Communist Party. There are Chinese role in resolving the conflict of the party. It can be real or perceived. It's media report. But that kind of storage was only coming for India, but it has now it's coming from Chinese side. So I think this thing has to be, a Chinese has to keep that in mind that whether they want to go in Chinese policy, uh, they want to follow the Indian style, or they want to continue with what they were enjoying in the past. Uh, I think the rise of China is obvious. Uh, China is a power, power, rising power, so it has created space around South Asia, which every great power creates. America is miles and miles away, and it has spaces in all the South Asian pockets. I think major spaces in all the South Asian countries is because of the flawed policies of India or the other partner countries. China get spaces. If there was no blockade, there was no space for China. Nepal would have never even dreamt of signing BRI with China. I would, I, I'm, I'm strongly convinced on that. Um, so I think now uh, there are a few things that China also need to take care of. Like uh, if you start going the Indian way, you have to, be, you, you, you'll also face similar reactions. Uh, because you should understand that how India has been reacted here. In Nepal, it's the Nepalese political force that invites Indian interventions. And it's another faction which entertains and welcomes Indian intervention. And there is one force that curses Indian intervention. I'll give you one example. When Army Chief of Nepal was sacked, when Prime Minister Prasanna was the Prime Minister, Nepali Congress invited it. UML and Madhesi Party enjoyed and they welcomed it and Maoist cursed it. There are several examples that one force invites. It can be same with China that one will invite Chinese intervention, one will enjoy, and other will curse. Are, are China prepared for that? I think China has to prepare if they are going to have such kind of adventurism in Nepal. Uh, let me come to tribalism. I think India is economically engaging with China. Nepal should also engage because Nepal also needs prosperity, employment, development, and all those. Security interests of China and India are genuine in Nepal, and Nepal has to address it. If Nepal fails to address it, they should not dream of anything called tribalism. Second, there will be intervention from both India and China if security interest of China and India is not addressed. Because great powers, they intervene. Their power is to intervene. America intervenes around the world, and they have created that power for intervention. They have military just to intervene. It's not for keeping them just uh, for employment. So great power intervenes. Nepal, if they want those powers not to intervene, it has to address the genuine interest of the neighbors. I think major stakes of Tribalism lies on India-China relations. If the relations are not improved, we can't think of bringing them together because they are two big powers and Nepal has uh, no role in that, in fact. If they are together, again, Nepal, even not if it doesn't play a role, they will bring Nepal to play a role. Because when two agrees, they pull the smaller one. That, that is, uh, it's easy. But a weaker one cannot pull two big elephants. So that is the re reality which Nepal has to understand. And for that, I think Nepal should stop playing India or China card. I'll end it here with lots of questions, and let's start with the question. The first question is for Professor Muni. Professor Muni, can you hear me? Hello? Yes, I, I can hear you. Okay. So we have a question from a former Nepalese ambassador to China, Lira Mani Powder. He says, China Study Center in collaboration with CICIR has organized a program on China-Nepal India Economic Corridor a prospect for trilateral cooperation in September 2016 in Kathmandu. Despite assurance from Indian embassy in Kathmandu, no one was present from India. It indicates that India is reluctant to participate in trilateralism. Professor Muni, uh, being a scholar in Nepal, India matters can be, can you share your perspective on this issue? Could you suggest Indian government to join the trilateral cooperation, enhance economic activities and improve people will Beijing in the region? And that is for you. Next question is also for Professor Muni. I would like to know your view. What's wrong in parental relationship or what is your opinion on this regard? There is one question it's not mentioned. What about China's military exercise in South China Sea? 
maybe it's for Chinese uh, participants, the speaker. What about China's military exercise in South China Sea amid the crisis and territorial claims in India? Isn't, is it a show of growing belligerence and aggressiveness? So maybe Professor Jiadong or uh, Professor Wang can answer. Another question for Professor Muni. We, 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 are, we have three nuclear power countries in our close vicinity and such tensions fulfill situation is too costly to ignore. Can China, can India as a large democratic country adopt a more pragmatic approach to solve outstanding problems in Nepal, China, and Pakistan, which could pave the way for the establishment of lasting peace and stability in the region. Sincere dialogue and negotiation can solve all kinds of problems between states. This is for Professor Muni. Maybe I'll come with another round of questions after a while, but one question for Professor Deepak. Uh, I, believe there is, I believe that in any post-pandemic world order that emerges, Regardless of whether it's US centric or China centric, there is no scenario in which India, a home of one sixth of humanity, will occupy a place. The question is, will India emerge as a part of the problem or part of solution? Will we emerge weaker or stronger as a nation? Let's start with Professor Muni. Well, I, you have raised, uh, uh, promote the number of questions. Uh, I, I don't even exactly remember them uh, now, but let me, respond to whatever I remember. Uh, one, uh, some of the questions revolve around the triangular relationship. Now, triangular relationship has to be to the advantage of one or the other. In, in India's perception, China wants a triangular relationship because they want to use Nepal for coming into China for both strategic and economic purposes. Now, in, India doesn't have that intent to going to China via Nepal. This is a very, 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 very clear uh, thing. In fact, India and China are having a huge commercial relationship and uh, all kind of strategic equations with China. We have a triangular relationship with Russia, India, and China. So they, uh, there is, uh, uh, in, the, in the perceptions of the policymakers, Nepal is not needed to interact or engage with China. So what, what for it should come up? Now, the question of BRI has come up again and again. And uh, mind it, uh, India has not accepted BRI, partly for its security and sovereign reasons, because they are working in Pakistan-occupied Kashmir, uh, without, uh, which is a disputed area, uh, accepted even by the Chinese. But also the BRI projects are not open to India. Chinese have never consulted uh, India. How can we collab collaborate with, you know, you, you, pro you send, it's like India sending a project and asking China to come and join it. And if you don't join it, well, you are not interested in this kind of a relationship. So there are, uh, there are uh, problems like that. Uh, because of this triangular relationship is, in fact, I asked once uh, some of the Nepali leaders who were asking for the bridge, and I said, uh, find out first if both India and China are looking for a bridge. In fact, they have a, they have a, uh, as I said, a very strong bilateral relationship. It is for Nepal to connect with both of them, which Nepal can. And as you said, uh, 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 promote very rightly that in doing so, Nepal has to take care of the sensitivities of both the countries. I may also, you know, in in lot of discussions. There is a comparison of India and China in Nepal, India and China in Nepal. To my mind, to some extent, this comparison is unrealistic. Economically, you can talk in terms of numbers. China is spending so much of money on so much of the projects. Pramod said no major projects, initiatives are being taken by uh, India. Uh, you have forgotten Tribhuvan Rajpath. You have forgotten Tribhuvan Airport. Uh, you know, these were the major projects which India took at a time when China had no, no sense of what Nepal's requirements could be. It is true that such major projects have not been taken by India later on, largely because of economic constraints. We cannot match, there is absolutely no shying away from the fact that we cannot match the Chinese economic uh, purses. And mind it, many of the Chinese projects are very highly overrated. All of you know, I mean, I have learned it through the Nepali media, about the controversy on Pokhara airport costs. What were, uh, I, almost by $100 million, uh, it was inflated. 
Now, if it was inflated by that, where is that money going? That money is going in greasing many of the political relations and political equations in the understanding of India. So there are aspects of the BRI, there are aspects of the way Chinese are functioning, uh, which uh, India doesn't find it compatible with. I'm sure there may be ways in which China doesn't find the way uh, India operates or acts uh, in Nepal. Now, India and Nepal had, uh, I think, a very different relationship because while Chinese and Nepalese relationship is confined to state-to-state -state interaction, now they have started coming into the people's level. But still, it is largely for politically oriented purpose. Whereas India-Nepal relationship is a genuinely social relationship, a genuine relationship of the people where they don't take the state into account. The Nepalese and Indians react with each other without a state coming in the way. There is no way in which China can interact with the Nepalese without the state coming into the way. I, I, you know, these are, somebody said that, uh, I think one of our Chinese friends said, oh, we have all the same systems of, uh, the, or, or probably Deepak said we have uh, uh, systems. I don't know, somebody said, no, I'm sorry, the, uh, the Nepalese system a political system is much more akin to the Indian political system than to the Chinese system, irrespective of the fact that it is being dominated by the Communist Party. Simply by Communist Party, you, are, you have a democratized Communist Party. You are not like the Communist Party of the Communist Party of China. There are huge qualitative basic differences between the way the political parties and the people operate. Therefore, I find a lot of hurdles in the vision of, or, or I would say dream of, the triangular relationship becoming a very healthy. There may still be areas which can be found out where all the three can work together, but they will have to be very limited, very, uh, very confined one. Uh, this is what I wanted to react with some of these questions. You know, I had a lot of other points to make, but I don't know if I have time I, even to uh, leave the meeting at three o'clock, another half an hour there, but I'll stop here. If there are more questions, I'll, I'll be happy to respond until then. Um, Professor Ziyadong? Professor Ziyadong, would you like to make comments? I think I wish you the, some specific questions. Maybe I can respond to some specific questions, not just the general comments. I'm waiting for some questions. Yeah. Okay, and then Professor mm -hmm. Bali. Okay, uh, I think uh, the premise of your question, you know, I don't uh, agree with that, uh, that uh, post-COVID-19 uh, world order, it is uh, going to be, a, you know, uh, it is uh, heading for a big change. I don't think so. I don't think uh, the liberal order, so which we have seen that it, it will uh, demolish or it will go away. I don't think, and the Chinese, they also don't want that, you know, because they have benefited from the liberal order immensely, you know, uh, the capabilities, the capacities which they have acquired till date, I think uh, it, 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 it is uh, because of the, uh, the liberal order. Uh, but yes, uh, I think there would be a lot of churning uh, as far as, uh, uh, you know, uh, economic uh, cooperation with the countries is concerned as far as the, 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 the strategic engagement between the peoples it is concerned. Because uh, China uh, itself, I think, uh, you know, it is uh, aware that the kind of security America provides to the world, you know, uh, in um, Asia Pacific or other areas. So it is not in the position, you know, to uh, do that at this point in time. So to contemplate that, you know, the China and U.S., so they are, uh, uh, they, they, they are advocating the world order or the institutions of their own liking uh, and force the countries to choose between them. I don't think this will happen so soon. You know. Yes, uh, uh, yeah, yes, as far as, uh, you know, uh, the rivalry between uh, the United States and China is concerned, it has intensified. And, uh, and, and I think uh, it is already sort of like a discrete cold war, you know, which is uh, happening. So this is, uh, this, this is uh, heating up and this will 
continue to heat up. In. And as a result, uh, I would say that uh, the kind of uh, decoupling, you know, uh, with China is being talked about. This will also not be a complete reality, you know, especially in this part of the world, in India. You know, many of the people, so they, they, they argue that, oh, this is a huge opportunity for, in, opportunity for India. I, I believe that, yes, you know, some of the companies, so they will definitely uh, be, re, be rerouted uh, from China to various other parts of the world, especially Southeast Asia, and also some of them to India. But to say that, you know, it is going to be a hard decoupling, I don't uh, buy that argument, you know, because you see, uh, it is in American interest not to lose China as the largest, uh, you know, uh, one of the largest importer, importers of the American good, goods. And secondly, I think that China will also not be willing to uh, derail the entire relationship you know, with China, as, uh, with, with the United States. So yes, you know, some of the decoupling is taking place primarily in the sectors uh, where America treats that they are sensitive and where uh, it believed that China has emerged as a competitor. For example, electronics and semiconductor, this is going to be the first choice of the American companies. And this is already been seen on the ground. The 33 of the Chinese companies, those who are in, 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 in uh, AI, quantum computing, so on and so forth, you know, so they have been subjected to sanctions by United States. And in fact, United States, they have devoured their own companies to trade with these companies. And, and I think the list will uh, go on. So as far as India is concerned, yes, I think India would be, uh, we would be benefiting from some of them. But at the same time, as I said that, you know, uh, uh, we should not be over enthusiastic about, about it because we have our own problems. We have to uh, provide a good infrastructure uh, to uh, the investors uh, if you want to attract uh, foreign direct investment. We have to reform our labor laws. We have to reform our land acquisition policies, so on and so forth. You know. So I think uh, uh, the way you are seeing that, you know, uh, the the post COVID nineteen world order will have to make choices. I don't think uh, it is that uh, you know black and white where we have to make choices. And of course, India doesn't want uh, to be identified. In the, in the League of the Nation where you are forced to make choice between United States and China. And I don't think India will choose either United States or China because, uh, because China is as important as for our economic development as United States is for our security requirements. So therefore it is going to be a balancing you know, of, the, uh, of, of, of the Indian policymakers how to uh, strategize our foreign policy priorities. Thank you. Uh, Professor Liming Wang. Okay. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, just now you mentioned the uh, South China Sea issues and also uh, talking about the China Indian uh, standoff in uh, borders. And I think uh, actually for Chinese sides, we say uh, actually China adopts a defensive. Uh, uh, postures towards the least disputes. For the South China Sea issues, uh, you, you know, last year, uh, Vietnam government has uh, sent a, a, a document to UN and also accused China of something like that. And uh, also, uh, this year, uh, why the, there is a, a, a small confrontation uh, in, in, in the South China Sea between China and Vietnam, that's because uh, uh, the, the Vietnam has been illegally uh, freed into China seas and uh, try to fishing. So, so, so like they try, China make a very big uh, response to to Vietnam, and also for China's uh, uh, China seas uh, con con confrontation with the Malaysians, and also have uh, some background. Because I'm not a specialized in South China Sea, I only know some of the background. It's not a, because of China adopt a, a fancy uh, policy towards these countries. And concerning the, the, the okay. current uh, borders uh, standoff between China and uh, Indians, 
uh, as I got the information so from uh, Chinese media, uh, when when the scandal broke up in uh, in uh, in uh, in five May, uh, for Chinese side, we are really surprised because the the, the area, the the, the Galwan, uh, valleys, is very clear. There are no any uh, different perception of the line or actual control. So this is the first time Indian armies have been to put into the, uh, the this, these lines or actual control. So for Chinese side, we think this is the Indian armies want to take advantage of the China's weakness because the Indian uh, United States was criticized China's the, the, the uh, geopolitical comp competition between United States and China is intensified. So Indian take advantage of Chinese weakness and the stable China in the back. So that's why China uh, take a very strong uh, position, uh, sent a, a, a large amount of the uh, army from, from uh, land to, to the borders areas. So this is the background. Uh, this is the Chinese perception. Okay. Uh, now we have a few more questions. I'll go to Professor Muni first, and there are other very short questions now. Uh, there's one for Professor Muni. Is the rise of Hindutva in India a threatening to Nepal, which has survived hard to achieve secularism? Okay, say it again, say it again. Is the rise of Hindutva in India a threat to Nepal's secularism? Is India, Hindutva a threat to Nepal's secularism? Second is that uh, Muni pointed monarchy as a source of anti-India sentiment. If it is so, uh, why there's anti-India sentiment even after that? Uh, third is why India feels so uncomfortable with Nepal-China relations? Is it necessary to take India's enemy as Nepal enemy? Three questions. Now one to Professor Chang. A recent mm -hmm. internal report of CICIR uh, warned China's top leadership of rising tide of anti-China sentiment in the wake of coronavirus outbreak. Your thought. And one very short comment and question for Professor Bali. Is it only mm. a phase of low point in Nepal-India Nepal relations or it is a paradigm shift? So let's start with Professor Muni. All right, thank you. The Hindutva threatens to Nepali secularism. I think it was Nepal who has repeatedly been asking itself to be known as Hindu kingdom. Uh, and that is started during uh, uh, during uh, Mahindra's uh, period, and you have you know that you have a party which is still wants to have that campaign. I agree with you that India also there is a very strong section which is talking about Hindutva, and my very frank feeling is that uh, when they ask Nepal to become a Hindu state, they should first make India a Hindu state. Why I am saying that because when they try to make Hindu uh, India, Hindu state, India will, India will, uh, you know, tatter apart. This is, this is absolutely suicidal course to make any state on the basis of either a, a, a sectarian identity, whether religion or ethnicity or language or anything. And we have seen it in South Asia anywhere, like in Sri Lanka, like anywhere else, Pakistan, you can see, if you make a particular state identity, and minorities would suffer, would be uncomfortable, and we are a diverse society, we cannot afford it. Therefore, I, um, I don't think that um, uh, the, uh, India's Hindutva should try to make Nepal Hindutva. You Nepalese should ask Indian Hindutva forces to first make India Hindu state, then come to Nepal. That would be the best answer. Uh, Anti-Indianism is started by monarchy, I said anti-Indianism was started by monarchy for political purposes, for the purpose of regime saving. Monarchy has also done many things, whatever India has asked them to do that. Therefore, monarchy has used anti-Indianism to protect itself. And that tendency has not gone. Even as you said, Pramod himself said, there are political parties which invite India to be on their side for their own power games within Nepal. This has been happening all along, and that's why I think India is stupidly, by aligning with one party or another party, has actually spoiled its own goodwill. Whereas uh, China continued to remain confined to state, now they have come into politics and they will 
re reap the fruits of this kind of an intervention later on, I, I suppose. Therefore, I am not in favor of this kind of a thing, but I must explain. I said monarchy used it for political purposes, for regime security. And that is a purpose which many political parties are also using. I would say not uh, the present ruling party as an exception. It is not an exception. Now, uh, we are not asking you to accept China as an enemy. You are absolutely free to look, look into Nepal's history. You were a tributary state to China. Do anything which you want to do to China. It is entirely your independent sovereign decision. But I must submit that anything which China does in Nepal, which might hurt India's security interests, we will raise objections to that. So that is all we are saying. And it is necessary for us to remember that the BRI has a strategic purpose. Please, if you, do, if you want to close your eyes, you can close your eyes. India will not close its eyes. Look at Gwadar, look at Hamman Tota, where they have brought in as a commercial uh, uh, port, they have brought in submarines. What have the submarines to do in Colombo? Uh, can anybody answer? In, in Gwadar, they have said that a part of it would be for strategic purposes, military purposes. And any road, there are, there are no roads, no ports, no airports, which cannot be attributed with the strategic objectives. And this is what India's problem is. Therefore, we have problem with the Chinese involvement where it affects India's vital interest, not otherwise. I mean, that is my understanding. I don't know how the government and the policy functions. These are the three questions which were raised to me. If you uh, permit me, Pramod, I have yes, some sir. very quick points to go through. Uh, uh, very, very quickly uh, to Professor Zhang. A code of conduct, he said, on the border. Agreements of 1993 and 1996 are very specific. That we should stabilize the line of actual control and not use military apparatus there. Now, why have the Chinese started bringing the military? If you violate the code of conduct, and then uh, you say this is, a, this is just a code of conduct, it has nothing to do with line of actual control. Line of actual control is not decided, I know this. That is the whole problem. But even the code of conduct, which was a confidence building measure, has uh, not been accepted. Secondly, Indo-Pacific for India, please read my book, India's Eastward Engagement. We have been active, active culturally, and economically in the whole Pacific for a very, very long time, much before the U.S. was born. So we don't look at Indo-Pacific as being led by U.S. U.S. may try to lead it strategically. But for India, Indo-Pacific is a natural region for civilizational, cultural, and commercial interest for centuries, not, not for one, 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 one or two years. He also said we are maintaining balance between India and Pakistan. How are you maintaining balance between India and Pakistan? You have in your agreement with Pakistan accepted that Kashmir is a disputed area. You are going and taking your projects in the disputed area. And you have all kinds of objections when India takes a project in Vietnam waters. You say this is disputed, you can't come over. Now this is how you can't say that you are maintaining a balance. Just one more point last for my very dear uh, friend and, and former student Deepak. Deepak, you said uh, uh, India has a colonial uh, background. Yes, India has a colonial background. But we, are, we fought against the colonialism much before the British left it. Nepal has, Nepal's Ranas and even the earlier Shah Kings have worked themselves as a vessel to Nepal. They did not fight against the British Empire. We fought against the British Empire. We have the British legacy in terms of history. You are accepting 1816 as a British treaty as a part of your history. Why should you start from 1816 only? Why not before, say, 1750 or 1716? Why we not go back into the history? Look, it is a very delicate, sensitive, deeper historical point. Don't blame India by suffering from British colonial mentality because we have fought against the colonial mentality, not only in India, even in Africa, against the race rights. We were, we were fighting there. So please look at India's history a little more sympathetically, and you will find that we are not suffering from any colonial uh, hazards. 
yes, whatever the history has given to us, we have to protect them and we have to stand on them. Thank you very much. Professor Tan, maybe uh, you can go. For okay. So, so, okay, thank you. Thank you, Chair, and uh, also thanks to Professor Mani for your questions. So I find I have many questions. So firstly, for questions for, for anti-China sentiments uh, and in lots of countries, I, I think we have three reasons to understand the situation. And the pandemic is something very unique, very different. And uh, so and for three reasons, and China is very easy to be uh, blamed. The first, uh, China is the first place to report, uh, to erect uh, the pandemic. So usually people think the first place may be origin. And ordinary people, not the scientists, uh, they, they just have ordinary understanding. I think it's natural. And uh, the second reason, China's situation of pandemic is out of step with the world. And when China's situation was severe, the world was <coughs> small, was stable. And when the rest of the world was, was severe, China's situation is stable, is much better. So it's very different. I think many people may, may wonder, the may think why China is so different. So it's also different sometimes it's very easy to be blamed. The, the third, I think China side also need to rethink something ourselves. And uh, within China's social media, some comments are not very rational and uh, maybe it also stimulates some international sentiments. Uh, I try to uh, understand the situation uh, uh, through these three, three points, three perspectives. And for Professor Mani's question, you know, in our side, China is also the same issue. Why India army crossed the line? And uh, I think we, it's not natural for us uh, to blame each other. And, uh, and uh, as nation states, sovereign states, they have the duty to protect their territory. I think it's PRA, Indian army, the same. They are the same issue. And it's why I mentioned we, we, may, we must overcome, overcome please, nation please states, sovereign images. states. Please see the satellite images, you will know who has crossed where. I understand the situation, but I'm not on site. I don't know who is the first cross, no line on ground. Is everything based on your own understanding? If you think a line there, China crossed. If China understands it right, India crossed. This is why I mention, if we just based on this, no solution forever. We must change, not change the situation. We must change our mindset. You mentioned the China, Pakistan. You know, for India and Pakistan, the biggest issue is the Kashmir. China we take a neutral position between this biggest problem between India and China. So I say China is balanced, it's neutral between India and China. Of course, between your two countries, you have many, many issues, but the biggest one is Kashmir. I think for the biggest question, this problem we are neutral, China, China's policy is neutral. For British issue, you know, history, history is not a reason, not an excuse from everything. Sometimes history, is reasonable, is killed, sometimes not. For example, British occupied India is also history. It's wrong, it's wrong. It's wrong, we should change that India independent from British. India become an independent country. You, India's, in British governance over India is wrong. It can be changed. Why others can be changed? It's a totally different understanding between China, Chinese and India. You know, from a Chinese perspective, the colonial history is wrong. We should change. Not every history is right. If India can independence from British, why the line drawn by British can't be changed? I think it's the same issue. No one said we should uh, overthrow everything. No one said this. We must understand it's a problem. Then we have rights, we have reason, we have also very necessary to talk about it. So I, I think people within this meeting, many people, including me, you can professors, we understand the situation. 
we are also understand why we are different. So my suggestion is not just the case by case. The first issue, biggest issue for China and India is not a border issue. And I think Professor uh, 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 sorry, Professor Depak is also mentioned. Border issue is not the top priority. So we should do something else. And to build a political mutual trust between China and India, then will be possible for our two countries to solve issue. Every day talk about, every day talk about difference, every day talk about disputes. Just only one way, only one direction, one possible go to another conflict. I think I don't think conflict in the interest of China, in the interest of, 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 of India. We must do something uh, to, to prevent this happen. Okay, I'll stop here. Okay, Professor Bali, maybe just quick answer, one or two minutes. Yeah, very quickly. In fact, uh, Professor Muni has uh, answered it all for me because I'm not an expert of uh, Nepal uh, and uh, neither are I'm expert of Nepal-India uh, relations. But I think uh, what I uh, see uh, will... Uh, uh, I, I have just maybe one or two points to make. One is that we really need to shed the ambivalence, you know, and should revisit the special relationship, which I also uh, emphasized a little while uh, back. So that is one thing. And for this, I think we should open up everything for discussion in you know, open borders, the 1950 treaty and maybe other grudges which uh, both sides have. And it is in this connection that you know, we should not be taking our cultural bonds for granted. Uh, I think it is the part of the problem also. And, and, and if we keep on taking this for granted, I think we are heading for uh, you know, uh, troubles. And third, uh, you know, would be that, of course, as Professor Muni said, that uh, though I am in the favor of not looking, you know, at Nepal from the prism of security, but at the same time, if there is any intervention from, you know, other states, so which impacts on India's security, I think that Nepal should be sensitive towards, you know, our security concerns. So that is uh, what I want to uh, what I want to say. Thank you. Thank you very much. We have come to the end of the program. I'd like to thank all the speakers, all the panelists, and all the wonderful audience for this uh, for the participation. Can you make a very quick okay. comment? Okay, maybe one minute maximum. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. Uh, in fact, Professor Muni, uh, briefly, a uh, point I want to make is like the Nepali nationalism is not just against India or, or, or I mean, direct towards India because it is uh, Nepal's uh, internal policy determining Nepal's uh, sovereignty. And it is not that uh, Indians uh, fought, fought against the British colonialism. It was the world who fought against the British colonialism. Yes, Pakistan, Bangladesh, together, uh, there was a phenomena. But Nepal fought with Britishers also. And till the date, world... Pakistan did not exist uh, yes. Deepak, at that time. Yes also realized that uh, you know uh, recruiting the nepalese in the indian army also so this is a very crucial relation dimension there but uh, looking from the primarily what today the political parties are looking that it is not the two prongs strategy that we are talking about the border disputes or the you know the leftover things in the history that we should uh, negotiate let's be in a dialogue it's not that for the two and more half years that EPG, eminent persons report, have been you know, dwindling. The report has not been accepted by Indian Prime Minister Modi. So that's where the, the, the things are stuck. So the, let's uh, sit in the table to make a dialogue uh, and uh, let's negotiate the things. We'll Thank continue you. the discussion. We'll continue the discussion. Tomorrow we have a discussion on India-China relations. So please join us at 7 p.m. on Zoom. Bye. Thank you for Thank you, Pramod. Bye-bye.